four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, the show where two friends get together, watch an episode of the Gen 1 Transformer series in order, and then convene to talk about what they saw. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host's name is... I am Hoover, and I'm back. We're counting down to Hoovstinction. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> I was wondering, what's he going to do now that he's no longer the ultimate hoof? <laughs> <laughs> Countdown to hoof stinction. Hoof does stinction, if you know what I mean. Yikes. <laughs> Sorry. Womp womp. <laughs> Insert sad trombone. Or actually, if you ever do an audio drop for like the sad sound, I would love it to be the price is right. Boom, 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 boom. Wow. <laughs> I do love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the soundtrack of sadness okay episode 14 we are done with the three-part miniseries <laughs> the ultimate doom aren't we you'd think it's at the end but here we are in episode 14 countdown to extinction by reed robbins and peter salas here comes the the log line starscream kidnaps dr archiville and forces him to take him to a secret laboratory Starscream plans to blow up the lab's ultimate power source in order to destroy the Earth and claim the universe's ultimate power for himself. Pretty ominous sounding. Yeah, it sounds like Starscream's actually like going to have some chops in this one. He's not just <laughs> going to be like the, the gag or treacherous coward who whimpers at Megatron's feet. But why is this not part of the three-parter that we just watched? That is a darn good question, and I have no idea. Okay. This is completely tied in thematically and everything to Ultimate Dooms Part 1 through 3, so why they didn't just make this a Part 4, I could not tell you. It's like too much having to do with Ultimate Doom to not be a part of it, so I don't know what their thought was. If hmm, I mean, we could sit here and speculate a million years, but... Well, uh, yeah, you, but you're right to notice that it's that tightly tied in. Because uh, we have remarked on how, in this first season, there is a continuity. Like, the stories build mm -hmm. on one another. Like, you see Optimus looking for the space bridge. The episode after the space bridge is introduced. And they don't sort of bring you up to speed on what a space bridge is. Just like, they just like, have you found it yet, Optimus? I'm still looking mm -hmm. for it. Oh, okay. So, it's really counting on you and trusting you to follow along with the story. But this one... You can't start it without having seen Ultimate Doom. Like, it really feels like so tightly connected because when it starts, Victor Crowley just shows up and explains what we just saw in the last three parter, right? Yep. So brace yourselves for that. This is sort of a unofficial part four of a three part mini <laughs> Part three and a half. <laughs> yeah, sort of like how the Transformers American comics like ended with number 80 in a four part limited series. <laughs> So tell us about the writers. Reed Robbins had written on a couple of cartoons before, and Peter Salas had also wrote an episode of GoBots from around this time. But the pair would team up again on one episode in season two of Transformers called Quest for Survival. Oh, I don't remember what that episode is about. That's the one where Cosmos is flying around in space and there's these weird things called Morphobots or something. Oh, yeah, the alien cybernetic plants. Yeah. Okay. That's that one. Okay. Hmm. So they write that one next season. But they don't have a lot of writing credits apart or together. So hmm. they didn't do that much. So I have to ask myself, you know, this isn't the first time there's been like an odd name in the writer's credits for this show. I don't know like if their request for writers was a lot different than other shows or if they were like tapping into people who didn't typically write for cartoons or how that went. Because there's always been like a couple names where that person like only did this and like maybe one or two other things. So that's kind hmm. of odd. I don't know the story behind it either, but it leads one to wonder, or at least it supports the hypothesis we put forward on the show before about this show was made by a lot of hands that weren't necessarily talking to one another. And so mm -hmm. when these inconsistencies pop up, that just feels like that's going to be a natural consequence of that many people working on the same thing not necessarily being as deep into it as, say, like later on when we get Beast Wars, where it's like Bob Forward and Larry Dottilio really producing the show and writing a lot of it. Right? right. So, okay, the episode opens up, and we have Victor Crowley back, and holy cow, are we looking at Macross City post-1999 crash or <laughs> Zentradi initial attack? Because that's what it looks like. We're looking at a devastated Earth. 
Yeah, Earth is completely devastated in this opening scene. I mean, based on what we saw in Ultimate Doom, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. We see the Autobots just cleaning everything up, and they're repairing the damage done to Earth in Cybertron's wake when Cybertron was hanging out in the sky. Mm -hmm. We see everyone repairing bridges, writing buildings, sealing cracks and dams, etc. But with all the work going on, Huffer still finds time to sass Gears about the job he's doing. <laughs> Yo, Gears! Get with it! Put that slab in right, or we're gonna be here till the Big Dipper gets rusty! <laughs> well, and why wouldn't you? Because Gears is always getting in everybody else's case about being on time. So Huffer's like, come on, Gears, get the lead out. Come on, let's move it. <laughs> This scene feels really unique for the Transformers series. Rescue bots don't come along till way later. Most of the time in this series, the Autobots are really more or less just war machines defending, right? Like they're always mm -hmm. defending against the Decepticons. You never see them doing like helping out with the humans and with reconstruction or cleaning up the messes from their battles. Yeah. This is like a full, I want to say like 20 seconds of just showing the Autobots like repairing the earth. Mm hmm. And even, yeah. like, the Dinobots are helping out with it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, it's not just the usual status quo where the Autobots are just sitting at home in the Ark waiting for something to happen. Mm-hmm. No, they're active in the world. That feels special. That feels unique. We don't see it that often. I don't want to say we never see it again, but we just when I watched this again, that struck me. Mm-hmm. And that's another way it makes it feel like a part four rather than a whole new episode. Right, yeah. I guess a whole new episode, there would be an assumption that, okay... Many months later, after the repairs are underway, here's Optimus standing in front of Teletran 1 saying, I always think about Megatron. Yep. Not the case for this one. This one even feels a little odd starting off. Mm -hmm. But we cut to Deceptitown I under the sea, and it's not just the Autobots fixing stuff. Mm. First thing we see is a school of fish go by like we've accidentally tuned into Sea Lab 2020 instead of Transformers. This is the year 2020. The place is the Challenger Sea Mountain, the top of an underwater mountain, a complex beneath the sea. <laughs> However, as we pan down, we hear and then see an argument breaking out between Rumble and Skywarp. Can't you do anything right, Skywarp? Watch it, you metallic mini meatball, or I'll step on you. You and what army, you maxi turkey? And it seems these two are at it again, as we first saw them bickering back in Fire in the Sky. So they're really establishing a sort of sibling rivalry between these two. Though I think this is really kind of the last we see of it, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't remember offhand if we see any more of that happening in future episodes. I'll, we'll definitely keep our eyes open for it, because I think we both agree that this would be a fun thing for them to have developed further. Yeah, I really like it. Especially thinking that Frank Walker is playing both of them, so whenever <laughs> they get in an argument, he has to argue with himself. <laughs> That's true. And you you know he did it in the studio, right? You oh, yeah, I'm sure. And there was probably like no like stepping back from the mic and stepping forward to do the same right. voice. He was just, he was <laughs> right there. On like, it, just like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like one of the stories that Peter Cullen told when I saw him at BotCon years ago is that Frank Walker would actually perform a dog and a cat fighting at the same time like he could literally do both of them simultaneously which is like what how? i need to see a video of this how does that how does that even work but anyway so rumble is picking a fight with skywarp yeah that's very brave of rumble considering skywarp is at least like three to four times his size but I'm sure that Rumble knows that if it came down to it, he knows the other tapes and Soundwave would completely have us back. <laughs> and it's up to Thundercracker to break up this fight of all people. And we have Megatron assumed dead here. You know, they just saw the ship blow up and they're just like, well, I guess he's gone. So Starscream has run off with Dr. Arkaville. So all the remaining Decepticons are here on their own, essentially for the first time ever. And this really fascinates me. Yeah. This mix of personalities with no one clearly in charge. Yeah. I mean, it's the group is in total disarray. They're used to either Megatron being the clear leader or Starscream claiming he's the clear leader. Mm -hmm. So without either of those things, this is a new day for the Decepticons. This is another thing where I have to wonder how the fact that you were an only child and I had so many siblings colors our interpretation of the scene. Because this, mm. to me, as I look at the scene, this is exactly 
what it looked like when the babysitter wasn't paying attention <laughs> or when my older brother was gone. Like my older brother would like go play cards with his friends or something. And like now it's me and however umpteen million other siblings I had. And <laughs> it turned into that kind of Lord of the Flies chaos in the house. Like nobody's in charge, which means that everybody's just giving each other all of the business all at once. So <laughs> to me, it's like this felt very like a very natural scene. <laughs> <laughs> When Thundercracker shows up, he's like, shape up, you two. And I'm like, you? You're telling us what to do? Like, that's like what it would look like if I like walked in the room. Like, all right, everybody, shape up. Like, what What are you telling us what to do for? <laughs> and then like Soundwave is even like, yeah, look who's talking, Thundercracker. What? Yeah. What? <laughs> so Thundercracker, yeah, what, what does he do? He comes in and he picks up Rumble from the console that Skywarp well, just knocked him into. Yeah, Rumble's in the console because Skywarp literally just knocked him, swatted him away into the console. So Thundercracker yeah. picks him up and tells the two to shape up. All right, shape up, you two. There's still a lot of damage to repair. Look who's talking, Thundercracker. Rumble, start emptying the water pumps. But yeah, just like you said, even Soundwave is getting sassy here. And, you know, if Soundwave's, like, getting involved in bickering, you know, that things are not good. <laughs> <laughs> It's just I, madness. Yeah, I guess I hadn't thought about this either. This has got to be like some pretty like intoxicating brew for you as the guy who's always looking for insights as to how the relationships of all the Decepticons work. Mm -hmm. You get this weird outlier of let's take away two of the critical sort of ingredients of a Decepticon scene. Megatron and Starscream. Gone. What yeah. happens? Yeah, it's like baking a cake without flour or sugar. You're like, <laughs> what on earth am I going to get? It's all icing. <laughs> <laughs> I call this one the Parthenon. <sighs> Take a look at this, uh, this one I just built, Dad. It's a triple layer. It's all icing. So what is inside the icing? Is it just going to implode? Is it? What's oh, your favorite part of cake, Dad? The icing. Uh huh. So, <laughs> and I, I do have to point out that Reflector is not here. So who mm. knows what that means? Maybe they all got sick of him. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's off working elsewhere. But <sighs> we have this whole group of betas trying to get by <laughs> on their own with no alphas present. And it almost seems like Thundercracker, of all people, has assumed some semblance of command here because he's the one doling out all the orders. Maybe yeah. because he comes across as the oldest, he just mm -hmm. felt he had to do it in the absence of no one. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, just as a lot of the jobs I've had in the past has proven, just because you're the oldest doesn't mean you're always the best leader. Mm. <laughs> But he is beginning to issue out, like, he's like, okay, let's start fixing things. He at least is saying, like, go do a thing, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's not just saying, like, I'm the most... Starscream, he rarely gives any, like, real orders <laughs> outside <laughs> of saying, like, I'm in charge, everybody. Megatron is dead. I'm the leader. Follow me. Well, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> Thundercracker, to his credit, is saying, like, Rumble, go do something. Go do a specific actionable item. So bravo to you, Thundercracker, for showing up with action items to your meetings. I bet, you know what, if they had a meeting, he would actually have an agenda. Starscream would not have an agenda. Starscream would show up and it would just be a bunch of like drawings of himself. And it'd be like, it'd be like, first like, order of business is to praise me, the new leader of the Decepticons. <laughs> Did I tell you? Did I tell you that Megatron's dead? I'm in charge. Well, Megatron's not ex exactly dead, Starscream. He kind of, he tripped over something back there. I know. <laughs> But like Thundercracker would show up and he would actually have, you know, like, okay, like, you know, a motion to approve the minutes. And then Soundwave <laughs> would say, second. So this guy would be like, vote I. All right. He would actually run a good meeting. So that's that's my fanfic. <laughs> well, this seems to me, more so than any other reason I have ever come up with in the past, perfectly illustrates why Megatron keeps Starscream around. Oh. Besides giving him an excuse to talk more. Starscream is for sure a power-hungry jackass, thorn in Megatron's side. But when Megatron's not there, Starscream does accomplish things. Mm. And roll for it, he led the strike on that power plant. And even though it didn't end well and Thundercracker complained, it was still a close approximation of the Decepticon modus operandi as to take power from stuff 
and he mm-hmm. was like going through those motions. And they did follow Starscream into battle. They didn't seem to be very happy about it, but it was much more a close approximation to Decepticon typical business than yeah, you're what, we, right. what we're you're seeing right. here. You're right. Like they're not like they're having got enough of their act together to fix the house enough to go do missions like Starscream yeah. them do. Holy cow. So it just seems really clear to me now and these that's what I really love about doing this show is that there's I've always taken all this information in, but a lot of it just like never got processed. And just watching this episode again and seeing the complete disarray that the Decepticons are in really made me think. And I love this odd status quo. I wish we could get like a whole mini series of this, <laughs> of Thundercracker like trying to lead. Uh you know, you're right. This is something that, okay, one of the sort of conceits of the show is that we compare our experience watching it as young people versus watching it as an adult and how we feel about it then and now. And I'll tell you that one of the things that really, really bummed me out about the American comics was how little Starscream and Megatron were in the comics. Like, it feels mm. like they got Megatron out of the way as quick as they could. And then, like, Starscream doesn't become, like, a major character, I want to say, until, like, and they got into like the 50s ish issues, like mm-hmm. the underbase business yeah. and all that. And so when I was reading the comics as a kid, I'm like, yeah, well, it, it's not really interesting to read about like Shockwave and like all of these, you know, like, oh, here's a whole issue about Runabout and Runamuck. That's great. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's like we're not seeing like the core, like what you're describing is like the, the, the sort of the, the core dynamic of the Decepticons in season one. But as an adult, boy, oh boy, I would be very hungry for like, a four-part, five-part episode of Megatron and Starscream are gone and presumed yeah. dead. And then we're watching what happens with the Decepticons and how they shake themselves out. Are they even Decepticons anymore after that? You know, like, right. that's, oh, wow. As a kid, I'd be like, don't show me that. But as an adult, I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> What's really interesting about both our reactions to this is that they have nothing to do with the fact that this is a show about robots that turn into vehicles and other things. <laughs> this could be... You know, this could be some soap opera. This could be some sitcom on TV, but it's all about the character interaction and Mm -hmm. what the addition or subtraction of one character means to the other characters in the scene and in the in the show. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where you and I have always sort of been on the same page. It's like, sure, we enjoyed the toys and the fact that, oh, this robot turns into a truck. That's fun. Mm -hmm. Yes. But. That's not what really has kept us here all those years. We we love the interaction of these characters. The fact that Sunbow took these characters and turned them up to 11 and really sort of made that a key core part of the show. That's what's important here. Yeah. 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 And like what would happen if they did that miniseries where it like would, how would Thundercracker change as a character? How would Soundwave change? Like with an absence of Megatron, right? You got this mm-hmm. guy who's like so super loyal to Megatron. Now what does he do? Does he just yeah. like plant that loyalty on somebody else? Or or does he find out that he's got to like be more like Skyfire and find that central, what's his central principle? And when he finds the central principle, does he suddenly get less weird? You know? <laughs> do we find out that like actually he's got a little bit of a personality in there? And, uh, you know, this whole idea of keeping this little family in his chest means that he's actually a pretty good caretaker. And maybe he becomes like this nurturing figure in the Decepticon <laughs> army. It's like, it's like, well, Thundercracker starts confiding in sound. It's like, I can't keep this, these guys together. I can't get this thing to operate. Tell me about it. <laughs> talk to me, Thundercracker. You know, it's really great how I could talk to you, Soundwave. You're just such a great listener. <laughs> I'm not even being funny. Like, that would actually be something that I would be interested in seeing. <laughs> anyway. So Thundercracker gives Rumble some orders, and then, and then... Hey, I didn't volunteer for this geeky assignment. I want Skywalk's job. But a frenzy. Geek work's made for a geek like you. Frenzy. Whoa. Whoa. Frenzy. New character. Esteemed listeners of the podcast... Welcome to the debut of a new segment that I thought was going to have to wait until season two to debut, but it's kicking off right now, and it's called... Esteemed listeners, here is a Decepticon we have never met before. This is Frenzy, another one of Soundwave's tapes from the first wave of the toys. Now don't get us started. 
how on the show Rumble was in Frenzy's colors and Frenzy was in Rumble's colors. No, 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 no. We're not going to go into that. You can <laughs> look up that somewhere else. In fact, you can go to Rodimus Primal's YouTube video called Rumble and Frenzy, Who is Who, and that will lay it all out for you. But anyway, you if you need backstory on that, you probably don't, but uh, that's where you go. So Frenzy is the exact same mold as Rumble, just like Starscream, Thundercracker, and Skywarp are all the same, except for the coloring. So Rumble is that bluish purple color. And Frenzy is red and black. And not only are their bodies the same, but their voices are too. Except to me, it sounds like Frenzy's is pitched up just a little bit more than Rumble's. Probably I noticed that too. That. Yeah. But where did they come from is a segment we'll revisit every time a Transformer <laughs> is introduced as though they've just always been there around there. <laughs> It's not for situations like where there's a clear origin, like where they find Skyfire in the ice or when the Dinobots were created. It's specifically for cases where all of a sudden it's like we look over in the corner and there's someone new there and they just start talking like (laughs) like they've been there the whole time. (laughs) Oh, I have a feeling we're going to be using that drop a lot in the next like 15 episodes, but continue. (laughs) So while all this fighting is transpiring, we first see Frenzy literally crawling up from a hole in the floor as he complains that he wants Skywarp's job. And having just trounced Rumble, Skywarp is happy to go after Frenzy next. And he runs up and literally steps on Frenzy, trying to push him back down the hole he was working in. And keep in mind, Skywarp's like about three or four times his size. Yeah. But somehow this little guy is stronger than he looks, and he manages to fling Skywarp over into the wall by just grabbing onto his foot that he's being crushed with. Mm -hmm. Now seeing this, Rumble runs in to take advantage, and he literally jumps (laughs) up onto Skywarp's face, and it's all punches. Skywarp crashes down to the floor, exclaiming, Get off me, you walking junkyard! (laughs) So panic, chaos, in the Decepticon headquarters. So where did Frenzy come from? Was he just standing behind taller Decepticons all this time? (laughs) Was he partly or cloudy and just decided some new colors were in order? That's a throwback to episode two, kids. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't be Hoover if I wasn't full of Decepticon theories, so you bet I have a theory on Frenzy. Oh boy. And I think he is newly created by Soundwave. Hmm. I think... That at the end of the Ultimate Doom mini, with Megatron and Starscream both AWOL, Soundwave looked around, and he saw this ragtag bunch of other Decepticons he had to deal with, and he was intelligent enough to see that without someone here calling the shots, this team would soon fall prey to infighting. And who is the odd man out here? Thundercracker and Skywarp have a habit of sticking together, or at least working together somewhat fluidly. They don't typically argue with one another. Reflector, by definition, sticks together with himself, and this leaves Soundwave and the cassettes off by themselves. So I'm thinking Soundwave may have felt the need to add another to the ranks here that he could depend on in case things went south. Now you're saying, wait, Hoover! (laughs) When you did SOS Dinobots, it was your theory that the Dinobots had to be created dumb, because without Vector Sigma present... They couldn't bring new life into being, so the Dinobots had to be very simple. Mm -hmm. Commodore 64 level programs, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. And I stand by it. But now you're saying Soundwave just created a new guy. Now hear me out. (laughs) I love how you're doing the the TCPY kid again. (laughs) (laughs) Excuse me, you just said... Now, I'm saying through some kind of cloning or copying, Soundwave was able to make a duplicate of Rumble. They have the same voice, they have the same personality, they have the same powers. I'm suggesting that cloning is possible and it's easier than creating new life from scratch, which requires Vector Sigma or using pre-existing personality chips. And Soundwave clearly is skilled in creation as he's seen to produce the empty Energon cube thingies. He certainly seems to be the one Earth-based Decepticon who could figure out how to make more troops if he has to. We did have all those troops pop up in Episode 2 that Mm -hmm. weren't really explained. Those could have also been clones of Skywarp or Thundercracker. Who knows? So that's my theory, just that Frenzy is a literal clone of Rumble. Uh, which I also think is cool for another reason. What are their alt modes? Soundwave just copied a tape. 
Uh, oh, uh. that's right. Which, for those who don't remember, audio cassette tapes, <laughs> you would have a, a dual deck tape deck, and you would like put in a tape and hit record on the second tape, put in a blank, and you make a literal <laughs> copy of the tape. I like this. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> This is like pure icy slush Hoover theory, right? It's like take out the, actually it's just the syrup. It's just the Hoover syrup. <laughs> it's as it, it pure of a source of liquid refreshment as you could possibly get is that Hoover putting together a bunch of disparate ideas and, and, and like the evidence backs it up because when we see Frenzy in some later episodes, he has the pile drivers as well. He doesn't mm-hmm. use the, the sonic attack that's on his file card. He yep. does exactly what Rumble does. Yep. And if you think about it, I mean, we haven't seen this episode yet, but remember when the Decepticons make the fake Optimus Prime? Mm-hmm. And then Teletran can't even tell which is the real one? So there has to be, like, some kind of way for them to copy things and copy them exactly. Yeah, you're right. Well so it done. Just seems to fit in here. <laughs> I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I'm so smart. I mean, not not that I was sitting on the edge of my seat wondering where Frenzy came from. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the other part that I like about this. Hoover's here to answer all the questions you didn't ask. <laughs> this is what you've been doing for the last 25 years. Is like I, I'll never forget when we were watching the 2001 Robots in Disguise cartoon. You're like, okay, I think I know where the Decepticons and Ruination came from and how we could tie it to the G1. And I was like, why? <laughs> yeah, we'll get more into that theory one day. But uh, <laughs> but that's my frenzy theory. And if you're wondering if I have the same theory for Buzzsaw, yes, I do. But we'll get to that later <laughs> when Buzzsaw debuts because Buzzsaw still hasn't debuted. That's right. But yes, so, he, so Soundwave saw the writing on the wall when Megatron was gone. It's like, I'm going to need more help. Yeah. But no Vector Sigma, therefore, Rumble, get in the tape deck. Why? I'm making a copy of you. <laughs> You're getting a brother. Hop in. <laughs> You're getting a brother. <laughs> okay. So, he said, without an alpha present, got to increase the number of people on my side. And so, yeah. clone Rumble into an additional tape named Frenzy. Wow. So, now that you've been inundated with my theories on Decepticons, let's get back to what's happening. Which, by the way, is still barely two minutes in. I know. I was just thinking about this. Like we're like, <laughs> you know, almost thirty minutes into this, into this this recording, and we're two minutes into the episode. Oh man, <laughs> buckle up, everybody. Okay, so so Skywar versus Rumble. Rumble's just hitting his face, and Thundercracker runs up to lift Rumble off of Skywar. It's just bedlam here, but thankfully a door opens. And in walks Megatron, who booms, silence! And everyone is shocked to see him. Everyone thought he was dead. Mm -hmm. And Rumble remarks, But Megatron, we thought you were, you know... Well, think again! I've only lost a starship, not the war! (laughs) And this is cute because uh, Rumble is just like, we thought you were, you know. <laughs> the finger across the throat noise. Right. <laughs> and I love Megatron's reaction because it's great visually. He sort of like sinks down to Rumble's level and yeah. he screams in his face, well, think again. <laughs> <laughs> also, this goes back to my interpretation of the scene where this is what happens with siblings when there's no authority in the room. Right. And then yeah. like, I have very, very clear recollections of dad walking into the room when <laughs> like the moment when things are like at their worst kind of thing. <laughs> And you, the the moment you hear his voice, everybody just stops what they're doing. You freeze in place kind of thing. Yeah. So it seems like maybe these two writers grew up in big families because <laughs> they seem to be nailing it in that regard. <laughs> it matches my experience. Maybe my family leans more towards Decepticons. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like the Marilyn Munster who like got out and was like, I love Autobots instead. <laughs> anyway, but Megatron... Megatron says he has unfinished business with Dr. Arkaville, and Thundercracker exclaims that he's gone, and so is Starscream. <laughs> Megatron does not like this idea of them working together. Yeah. And suddenly Laserbeak enters, he flies in, and we learn that he was spying on Starscream and Arkaville and recording their conversation. 
And now Megatron has confirmed that the pair are indeed working together, and this needs to not happen. So Megatron orders the team into the air to deal with these traitors. So Megatron's back like two minutes, and already they're like being active again. Yeah. And not, and not just arguing about fixing the place. They're just back to their well-oiled machine, literally. Yeah. And that's, that's all these guys need. They need someone to tell them what to do. Let's put a, a dog ear on that because I think that that is an interesting analysis of the Decepticons and also like it's both an advantage and it's a disadvantage in that if your abilities are so fragile that they can only function when you're explicitly being told to take an action, right? Like if your agency is so removed from you that like if you don't have somebody literally bossing you around, you just fall into chaos and disorder. <laughs> Whew, that's... That doesn't sound like a great place to be intellectually. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Decepticons often are cited as the cooler characters. I would step in as the boring old adult, and as a boring old adult, this is my purview to be a boring old adult, uh, is to say, like, yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> look at that, everybody. Like, if they don't have literally dad yelling at them, they can't function. That's yeah. not as cool. So enough enough about the Decepticons for a while. Back at the Ark, Wheeljack, we see, has made repairs on Teletran 1 and has it up and running again. And the first thing it tells them <laughs> is that Megatron is back and the Decepticons are in the air heading who knows where. So Prime orders that they roll out and head off the Decepticons. Mm -hmm. And we cut to Starscream flying with Dr. Arkaville, who is guiding him to his secret lab. And once they're there, he uses the secret code sentence to enter the doorway in the side of a mountain. But impatient Starscream tears the rock door off completely and warns the doctor not to try his patience. Well, yeah, well, let's let's elaborate on the scene a little bit because, like, it, they do the whole old open sesame <laughs> gag here. But the writers were they were trying hard enough to build some character based humor into that old gag, right? Like the open sesame thing. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen a hundred times these old cartoons, but he does the, I, Dr. Archiville, <laughs> genius of science command, open sesame or whatever. And like he, he drags it out just long enough that you believe it when Starstream's like, all right. And he picks up the rock <laughs> door as it's sliding open and throws it off the mountain. He's like, you know, I'm just, just a warning to you. Like, Come on, don't don't waste my time with your uh, to quote Megatron, your pomposity. <laughs> so it, it's a cute moment. And they enter the lab, and the doctor shows Starscream his exponential generator, which promises unlimited energy. But he warns him to be careful, as disturbing its pulse could destroy every living thing on Earth. <laughs> Starscream reiterates that he doesn't care about those living on Earth. We cut back to Megatron and his bunch. And they're en route. As Rumble notices the Autobots following them, Megatron orders Skywarp and Thundercracker to deal with them. And we cut back to the lab, and Starscream has used his science knowledge to basically <laughs> set a timer on the exponential generator, which will set it off in eight hours. I love this. I love that he's like, I've interfaced your generator with a timing mechanism, and he's so <laughs> proud of himself. It's like, yeah. I hooked up an egg timer to your energy beam. <laughs> right. <laughs> which which effectively turns it into a bomb. Like when I flick this switch, it'll build power to infinite capacity. And the doctor proclaims that it will destroy the earth. <laughs> and Starscream is well aware of this. His plan is that by destroying the earth, he'll be able to collect all the energy. And Archiville says he won't allow it. And this causes Starscream to exclaim... You have no say in the matter, puny flesh creature! And I believe this is only the second instance of Decepticons calling humans flesh creatures, which I really do love. Mm -hmm. The Starscream plans to be on Cybertron when the Earth explodes and absorb all the energy from there. So he takes off with the Doctor and heads to Cybertron as the timer counts down. So if we could reflect on the scene just for a few seconds, I have a couple of thoughts on what, what's transpired here. One is I've spent a lot of years, I don't have like an academic chart on this, but I have like sort of a, a thinking aloud chart of different kinds of villains and how you would categorize them. And one of those villains is what I call sort of the love villain is that they love the world so much they just want to have it all for themselves. They're the greedy child character, right? Mm -hmm. And the one weakness of that character is if you threaten the thing they love, They'll even help their enemies to stop you from doing that, right? This is the bad guy who will team up with the good guys to stop an even worse bad guy, right? Like Skeletor in that one episode. Which episode is that? He has to team up with He-Man and I an think... An evil seed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
yeah, Evil Seed is going to destroy everything on Eternia uh, and make way for all of his plants, right? And so now Skeletor is like, okay, well, I guess I'll have to work with He-Man, you know? <laughs> we need more power. Skeletor, raise your Havoc staff. Now, it will be out of range soon. I don't know. If you don't, everything will be destroyed. Do it. And there's even in City of Steel, there's an that episode Megatron has to team up with the Autobots because Starscream sets a, a situation where everything's going to be destroyed, right? And I think I, that kind of villain is is always kind of interesting to me because of that that one hamstring that they have. Mm-hmm. And Archiville is like, there's a couple scenes in here where he's like, he's he's begging Starscream. He's like, the the thought of the extinction of Earth is unthinkable to me. So okay. He's an evil dude. He's not a good guy, but his actions come from this, you know, he he does have something in him that like he loves the earth so much, right? That yeah. he would and he even says to Starscream, he's like, "Oh, well, um, how about I stay here and make sure the timing mechanism goes <laughs> works well." Starscream's like, "Do you take me for an idiot? You know, you'd <laughs> shut it off the first second I left." And Starscream and that's why he takes him to Cybertron, and boy, is Arc villain for a bad time coming up. But yeah, so he's kidnapped the Doctor and taking him to Cybertron because he knows that he can no longer trust him because Starscream has threatened the one thing that he loves. And I have to ask you, as the Decepticon expert of this duo, do you think that there's anything that you could threaten that would make Starscream capitulate? Like the way that you, if you threaten to destroy the Earth, the Doctor will even turn against you. I, I don't know. Is there anything that Starscream cares about so much that you, you could actually get him to side with the good guys? Mm, that is a good question, and nothing is springing to mind at all. Because Megatron will if you threaten his Decepticons, right? Right. City of Steel, he says, what I do now, I do for my fellow Decepticons. Starscream wouldn't do that. Yeah, Starscream is all about himself and nothing else. <laughs> huh. So, I mean, just as a creative person, I think that's worth considering when you're thinking about developing your own villains. Like, do they have that or not? Right? Yeah. Is there like a secret weakness they have that if you brought it up, it would make their motivations be altered? Because I would I would argue that Cobra Commander in G.I. Joe is one of those love villains, right? Like, if you tried to destroy the world, he would certainly be like, hey, Duke, look, I hate your guts, but guess what? We're friends right now. Yeah. I need a place to live. <laughs> So yeah, it's not like Arkville is just like, well, I'll just I'll just live on Cybertron, you know. Yeah, that, that doesn't seem to be an option for him, right? And other villains might. Well, you could think of like other types of villains, like say the Force of Nature villain, like a zombie. They don't care. The you know the dark inertia villain, where it's like just destroy for destruction's sake. You know, they don't yeah. care. But and and then a madness villain, like say like the Joker, would he care? I don't know. Maybe maybe not. But. Yeah, the, this particular kind of villain is is an interesting one that I spend a lot of time with my students, like contemplating that kind of character, because mm-hmm. like uh, love's a funny emotion; it can make you do all sorts of things. Anyway, so <laughs> Starscream takes off with Doctor Arkville, and we close on the the timer counting down. Right, yeah, it's counting down. The Earth goes kablooey in eight hours, but in the meantime, might as well spend some of that eight hours thinking about purchasing Snake Mountain. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> Come to Snake Mountain! Yes, you did. Snake Mountain with Echo Microphone from the Masters of the Universe collection. Action figures each sold separately from Mattel. And hey, how about a snack as you head down to go by Snake Mountain? How about some Hershey, Hershey, Hershey's? When you take a bite, take a bite, oh, you'll say I'm right. Hershey, Hershey, Hershey. Oh, well, you know, but Almond Joy's got nuts and mounds don't. But mounds don't. don't. Almond Joy's got real milk chocolate, coconut and munchy nuts too. Mounds got deep dark chocolate and chewy coconut. <laughs> That's right, they advertised candy on TV. <laughs> It's not enough that they were like, hey, you could buy some toys while while you're here, but also you could buy some sugar. How about some Twinkies? How about some Almond Joy? How about some Fun Dip? <laughs> I mean, they do still have M&M commercials, but yeah. 
as far as like the range of candy commercials, I think very few and far between. Like totally. I don't watch a payday. lot of live TV, but I don't yeah. can't remember the last time I saw a candy commercial that wasn't for M and M's. And I have to wonder how much of that fed into the fact that a lot of my life in elementary school was thinking about candy. And a three-year-old daughter. Let's not forget her. Yeah, that's the age to be three. I'll tell you, I always thought if I could go back in time, I'd want to be a teenager. I'd go right to three. You don't get happier. You can't get happier than three. I watch my daughter. It's incredible. The other day, she's staring out the car window for 15 minutes, just smiling at nothing. Yeah. Oh, I can't get over it. Finally, I turn. Alexandra, what are you thinking of? Candy. Candy. Yeah, well, think of when was the, the last time you could daydream about candy, folks. Try that. Try it as an adult. You can't. <laughs> like, I did think about it, like, a lot. But anyway, yeah, they, they did spend a lot of time talking about candy on TV. Anyway, so, but the, the distraction can only last so long because we are suddenly oddly worried about Dr. Arkaville. <laughs> and as we come back, Starscream's flying through space as Arkaville begs Starscream to spare Earth. But sympathy is not an emotion that's present in Starscream. And th- there's a great moment here where you hear, like, first of all, Casey Kasem is actually doing like some real acting here. Where he's yeah. like, Starscream, I implore you. Mm-hmm. And Starscream says, compassion from you. You know, like, and he's got a point. You know, you sold out humanity in the, the last three episodes, you know, and like you were perfectly OK with enslaving them with computer chips on behind their ears. But the thought of wiping them all out and suddenly now you're like humanity's greatest champion. <laughs> shut up and sit down, you know. <laughs> but Starscream says, you know, in, in eight hours, I will be Lord Starscream. Now, this line always confused <laughs> me as a child. Right. Because he says it in such a way that it's like kind of hard to hear exactly what he said, but he's saying tyrant of the firmament. Is that what right. he says? Yeah. So like when I was a kid, I thought he said tyrant of the fatherless. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Starscream's going to start like an orphanage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like it puzzled me for the longest time as a child. I'm like, why? Why does he want to like enslave the fatherless people? That's not nice. Like, maybe they try to be like he's so mean. He's so mean. He, like you would enslave everybody? No, just orphans. <laughs> it's like that picture of Cobra Commander kicking a dog. Yeah, yeah, the one that dropped my selfie, Sama. <laughs> It's like, how do we make this guy the greatest a hole in Transformers history? <laughs> he hates orphans on top of everything else. Jeez. <laughs> but tyrant of the firmament. It's a weird line, but that is most definitely a weird line. <laughs> so we go back to the Autobots. Yeah, and a blast from the Seeker sends rocks raining down on Bumblebee because Thundercrackers and Skywarp are attacking. Hmm. But Prime is quick to have Brawn dig him out, and the Autobots transform and attack as Megatron orders the rest of the bunch to engage. Yeah, this is like Cannonball Run meets. <laughs> army battles right it's like this weird like chasing each other across the desert on the roads Mm -hmm. and it's like it's like well megatron why are you flying along the road but okay yeah there's a lot of odd things happening (laughs) in quick succession megatron manages to sneak up behind prime (laughs) yeah this part's great (laughs) and the pair begin brawling like he tiptoes up to him right like he's like behind him with his arms up and you think he's gonna do a guess who kind of thing (laughs) They begin brawling only for Prime to get the upper hand as Megatron calls for the quickest retreat ever, saying the Autobots are too hero-programmed to know when to quit. Mm. And the Autobots give chase on the ground. But this this whole little battle between them is bizarre because it lasts a couple seconds, yeah. and at no point are they talking while they're yeah. fighting. Yeah. Usually there's always some sort of banter going on, but not this time. It's like they're just like scrapping in silence. Yeah. So the Autobots give chase after the Decepticons. Basically, the Decepticons are kind of like leading them around. They're yeah. flying in the air, and the Autobots are doing their best to follow on the ground. So we cut to Starscream arriving on Cybertron, which is apparently only a few hours trip now. Remember, it was really close to Earth, and now it seems to be kind of close to the Earth, closer than it was originally. Right. So... Starscream lands on Cybertron and he meets up with Shockwave and Shockwave is surprised as Starscream enters with Arkaville and he declares that the Doctor is not allowed on Cybertron by Megatron's orders. Yeah, this flesh creature can't enter here. (laughs) 
And then, yeah, he does say, like, at the end, he's like, <laughs> I love this, this, too. I mean, I know that they, they wrote this line to tee up the next line, but I just love the shockwaves, like, Megatron said. You know, it's like, <laughs> he's the brainy smurf of the Decepticons. You know, it's like, Megatron yeah. always says. <laughs> wow, I, I never made that connection. As Papa Smurf always says, work is the key to happiness and the highest aspiration any smurf can. You are completely <laughs> right. But he's like, he's like, he's this flesh creature is not allowed in here. Look, it's not me. It's Megatron's orders. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to have this place filled with humans, but you know what, Megatron, he's kind of a stickler. Papa Decepticon always <laughs> says. <laughs> and then we cut to six hundred yards away, and then Shockwave crashes onto the ground in front of us. But Starscream claims that Megatron is no more, and he now leads the Decepticons <laughs> as he brandishes a Decepticon sigil. Which sparkles yeah. as it's displayed, just like Skyfire's Autobot Sigil did when he showed it to Megatron back in Fire in the Sky. So what is this? Yeah. Is this like some kind of permit to lead that you have to carry around in your wallet? <laughs> and it's like, he's got the Decepticon symbols on his wings, right? Right. It's like, what are you really showing us, Starscream? I don't understand it at all, but it's a, it's a weird moment. I, and I can't remember how that moment felt to me as a child. So I don't know like if that, I can't pocket this in kid logic. It just mm -hmm. makes zero sense. Like, it's just like a visual thing to say, like, look at who's in charge now. Yeah. It, like the music swells like, as he holds up the Decepticon symbol. <laughs> okay. It's weird, but. Well, Shockwave is shocked and refuses to believe that Megatron is dead, saying that he's indestructible. The Starscream's like, all right, call him. Go ahead. See where yeah. he is. Give him a call. Why don't you call up your living friend Megatron? <laughs> I love this scene. Yeah, I love, I love what Shockwave does here. Shockwave emotionally states there's interference preventing any contact with Earth, and he sounds so bummed. <laughs> It's rare to hear emotion in Shockwave's voice, but you certainly do hear. And I love how earnestly, like, so in this way, he's also kind of like, maybe he is like the brainy smurf of the Decepticons, because he says, like, but I assure you, Starscream, I will keep trying. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, don't you worry, I will do everything I can to find him. And Starscream's like, and no, no, you're not. This is the guy who was still calling Megatron after he was gone for four million years. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was the joke here. So, yes, he will keep trying. <laughs> I got but a lot Star of experience. Scream's first order is no further contact with Earth. As a null ray blast persuades Shockwave from further attempts, and Shockwave morosely agrees, yes, Commander Starscream. Yeah. And Starscream informs him that in less than three Earth hours, they can begin absorbing limitless energy from the destruction of Earth. So apparently it took Starscream around five hours to get to Cybertron, which tells us it's close-ish, much closer than originally. Maybe still between Mars and here? What say you, space boy? You love so, space and NASA and all that stuff. Any <laughs> thoughts on this? And I co-authored a book on rocket history, right? <laughs> yeah. So the biggest rocket we ever built, the Saturn V, what, what, it took two days to get to the moon. It was just 250,000 miles away on average. <laughs> so if it took five hours, I would say Cybertron is still within the orbit of the moon unless Starscream is like way more faster than the biggest rocket we've ever built. Like Saturn V is like two Omega Supremes, right? It's, a, it's <laughs> an enormous thing. So five hours, yeah, Cybertron's not that far away yet, but uh, unless, again, Decepticon technology, Starscream can fly in outer space. So, because like that's the other thing, if he's a jet, he doesn't have his own oxidizer on board. He would have to use Earth's atmosphere to oxidize the fuel to make the jet engines go, which means that he is not literally a jet. He's something more than that. He is like a rocket. Mm -hmm. So maybe he can go crazy fast, but he would have to be going so fast to get to Mars in five hours. I don't think he can go that fast. Uh, we'd have to look at his file card again. So yes, Cybertron is not very far away yet. Science! That's the headline that I bring. <laughs> so Starscream begins the preparation to absorb all the energy, and he says that the Doctor should be honored as he'll be the last of his kind. Mm. And the Doctor tries to stop the computer from executing Starscream's commands, but he is electrocuted. And this is one of those things about the the love villain. The love villain. I gotta find a better name for it. <laughs> but the villain who, if you threaten to destroy his thing that he loves, like, he does a heroic act, 
right? He mm-hmm. jumps at Starscream's computer. He's like, oh, I may not be able to stop the destruction of Earth, but I can at least stop you from benefiting from the destruction yeah. of Earth. And he tries to shut down the, the energy-absorbing computers. And then, yeah, he gets horribly electrocuted. And Starscream orders two reflector-style troops to take the unconscious doctor to repair bay. Oh, no. <laughs> Back on Earth, Megatron and his bunch divert off their flight path in order to lure the following Autobots into the trap. Because the Autobots are still following on the ground. They're just, they don't know where Megatron is going, essentially. (laughs) They're like, we just got to follow him. Yeah. He's up to something. What's your plan, Prowl? Well, I saw this movie called The Duel. Have you ever seen it? Steven Spielberg's first movie. Yeah? We just do that. You just follow him? (laughs) Yeah, we just do that. You know how menacing that truck was, Prime? That's going to be you. (laughs) <laughs> but Megatron has led them to the Valley of No Return. <laughs> and suddenly the Autobots are trapped in quicksand. Ah, because you can't have a kid's cartoon without quicksand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was a stand-up comic who did a bit about how, like, when he was a child, he thought more I think there about... were multiple stand-up <laughs> comics. <laughs> yeah, like how much we thought about quicksand as children. Like, it, it is something that feels very primal and buried in our lizard brains like the thought of (laughs) sinking into something and not being able to get out is so profoundly frightening (laughs) you'd be dumb not to use it in your kids cartoon i was a very nervous kid i was anxious all the time when i was younger but what's nice is that some of the things i was anxious about don't bother me at all anymore like uh i always thought that uh, quicksand was going to be a much bigger problem than it turned out to be (laughs) because if you watch cartoons Quicksand is like the third biggest thing you have to worry about in adult life. (laughs) Behind real sticks of dynamite and giant anvils falling on you from the sky. I used to sit around and think about what to do about quicksand. I never thought about how to handle real problems in adult life. I was never like, oh, what's it going to be like when relatives ask to borrow money? (laughs) Now I've gotten older, not only have I never stepped in quicksand, I've never even heard about it. No one's ever been like, hey, if you're coming to visit, take I-90, because I-95 has a little quicksand in the middle. <laughs> Looks like regular sand, but then you're going to start to sink into it. So, of course, Megatron being Megatron, he has to stand above the Autobots and taunt them and laugh at their expense. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and he orders Laserbeak to stay behind until the last Autobot sinks into the sand, and he and the rest of the Decepticons depart. So the Autobots continue sinking, and as Laserbeak swoops down to get a better view, to get some better footage for Megatron, Mirage fires a rocket at him, and the blast causes Laserbeak to revert to cassette mode, falling directly into Jazz's hand. And Ironhide uses his liquid nitrogen to harden the quicksand, and the Autobots are able to climb out. Mm. And Jazz exclaims, Hey Optimus, how'd you like to hear number one on the Decepticon hot cassette charts? As I believe the Earthlings say, lay it on me, man. You've got it. Let's hear what laser beat tape. Yes, Starscream, I understand. Good. Take me to your secret laboratory. I have use for your other inventions. That is our next destination, Autobots. Transform and rubble. So they're able to hear what Laserbeak recorded while he was spying on Starscream and Dr. Archiville. Uh But how do they know where Archiville's lab is? (laughs) I guess Archiville maybe gave Starscream directions at the end of the recording. See, you head north for this many miles, and then there'll be a little cliff, and you'll see the cliff looks kind of like a little arrowhead, so you go in that direction. (laughs) Well, I don't know, but now both the Autobots and Decepticons are headed to the doctor's lab. We can't skip over this without also reflecting on Optimus being, he's getting into such dad mode that he's even making like dad reference, or not, it's not exactly a dad joke, but he's talking like a dad where he's like, as I believe the Earthlings say, lay it on me, man. Uh, they do it much better in a future episode when when it starts with Optimus playing basketball and he's like getting the expressions wrong, which is much more fun. But <laughs> but like this goes back to Ultimate Doom Part One, where he's like, "Does the Earthling say fat chance, fathead?" Yeah, so I was like, "Do do Earthlings really say that?" <laughs> well, the Decepticons arrive first at the lab as Megatron inspects the exponential generator, and we see the timer counting down as it reads two hours and fifteen minutes. Until we head to the second commercial. Wait a minute, we're going to commercial break, 
with two hours on the clock, two hours to midnight to, yep. to borrow an expression. Oh man, I am not ready to think about crass commercialism. Are you? Well, I don't know. This uh I'll, I'll tell you what's not helping my anxiety at this moment is that you're advertising a toy slash board game where I have to operate on a human being to remove funny <laughs> things out of his body and then it makes electric noises when don't I don't touch it the sides. Oh, you blew it. It's my turn. Take out a for one hundred dollars. It takes a steady hand, because if you touch the sides here goes the funny bone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm hungry too, but you know, I don't emphasize that by having me play a game where hungry animals try to eat white pellets. <laughs> That's not interesting to me right now. I'm kind of worried hungry, about the earth hippos. being destroyed. Do, 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 do. Playing hungry, hungry hippos. Hungry, hungry hippos. I win. Hungry, hungry hippos from Hasbro. Hungry, hungry hippo. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yes, I do love Sergeant Slaughter because he is as strong as they come because he can take on 100 Cobras and set them on the run. Meet Sergeant Slaughter and his Triple T tank. Sergeant, Sergeant Slaughter is now a part of G.I. Joe. Where is he now? Because we need to take on 100 Decepticons and set them on the run and throw an exponential generator into deep space. Please, Sergeant Slaughter, <laughs> we're begging you. Get over here right now. But he's not coming, is he, Hoover? Ah, not even Sarge can save us now. As we return, Megatron is lustily eyeing the exponential <laughs> generator as we see the timer is now at 159.03. Wait a minute, that was a 15-minute commercial break? <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> and it's less than two hours till the Earth goes boom, and suddenly Rumble bursts in, says the Autobots are here, and the Decepticons uncharacteristically calmly exit the building, looking for them. <laughs> They don't rush out to do battle. They just like, well, let's just walk outside and see if we can see what's going on. <sighs> the Decepticons are all outside looking around, and suddenly we hear Prime say, hello again, Megatron, as we see Prime's <laughs> fist come up from below, catching Megatron in the jaw and sending him flying. So, like, Optimus did, like, a spider crawl toward them? <laughs> It makes no sense. There's no way Prime could be right below Megatron and not be seen. Uh, but I suppose it could be Hound's holograms, I guess. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe he like had Optimus like looking like a boulder like in Roll For It. <laughs> and Megatron just happened to like, walk up. Well, I'm going to stand in front of this boulder. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be a bad translation of storyboard to animation. But yeah. regardless, a battle breaks out as Megatron throws a boulder at Prime who dodges, allowing it to hit Rumble, rushing behind him, and this gives Prime a good laugh. <laughs> Your aim's improving, Megatron! So, during this battle, we cut to Cybertron, where we see Starscream telling Arkville that his Metacroids had some problems repairing him after the electrocution, as Arkville is now even more robotic than before. Yeah, he's looking like a Centurion now. Yeah. He's shown his reflection in a mirror, and the doctor cries out that he can't even move. Starscream remarks that he deserves a rest after all that meddling in his affairs. More points are getting put on the tally of Starscream being a real POS, like the worst one of Decepticon history. Because like Megatron, for all of his flaws and all of his nastiness, has never like mutilated a person. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of what he did here. He's like, yeah, I'm, I set my place up so that if you touch anything, you'll be horribly electrocuted and probably burned in all sorts of terrible ways. Well, how much worse can I make it for you? I'm going to like take away like two thirds of your body. Yikes. <laughs> it's like Starscream and Cronenberg need to get together. <laughs> and how about that very awkward portmanteau of Metacroids? Metacroids. It's only subtracting one letter. They're not <laughs> medic droids. No, it's Metacroids. <laughs> Metacroids. Come on, let's not ignore the fact that it sounds more like an affliction than anything else. <laughs> I have Metacroids. <laughs> yeah, it's like that's actually like the name of Cosmic Rust. You know, Cosmic mm -hmm. Rust is like the general expression of what the affliction is. But what? well, how do you know you have Cosmic Rust? Well, you get Metacroids all over your back. <laughs> well, we cut back to Earth as Prime has now entered the doctor's lab and is eyeing the exponential generator. But Megatron bursts in, saying it belongs to him. And Prime thinks that Megatron won't risk shooting at him if he stands right next to it. But Prime points out that this device is unstable and on a timer, which we see reads 53 seconds now. So they've been fighting for two hours. I can believe that. I yeah. mean, it seems a bit much, but... Eh. 
Well, you got to take it down to the wire in these kinds of stories, for yeah. sure. And then Megatron suddenly receives a communication from Shockwave <laughs> on Cybertron. Of course, Shockwave's been trying all this time. And Megatron is still being Megatron because he's like, not now, I'm busy. <laughs> yeah. Megatron literally tells him to call back later. <laughs> And I just, I just love that like this is following an old routine that the two have been playing out for four million years now. I call him over and over again. He doesn't answer or he tells me to call back later. Boy, that's some dedication on Shockwave's part. <laughs> Brainy Smurf. So yeah, he, he what is what is Shockwave calling him about? Well, Shockwave warns Megatron about the timer on the exponential generator and that it will explode any astro second. Astro second. And then we see the timer has two seconds left and Megatron rips it from the wall just in time and Shockwave <laughs> is stressing out. Megatron! Megatron, are you still there? Everything is under control, Shockwave. Where is Starscream? On Cybertron. He planned to destroy the Earth and gather the energy of the destruction. When I get my hands on that traitor, his catalytic data assembly is mine! <laughs> Shockwave was sure that Megatron was going to be killed, and he was so panicked about it. He thought it was going to be that scene from Scream, right? This is very consistent for Decepticons, is that they think Megatron is the best. And if you're on the phone with Megatron, and he's next to a bomb that's about to explode in any <laughs> astro second, yeah, you're going to be torqued up about it. But yeah, it's a great performance by Corey Burton. Like, this is the most agitated we've ever heard Shockwave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, those nice moments earlier on where he's like, oh, I, I'll keep trying to call him, I promise. Mm -hmm. Normally, he's just, like, I think it was in Divide and Conquer was like the first time we heard when he did like, the fools, they're back. Yeah. You know, where we actually hear like a little bit of difference in tone in his voice. So this is a neat one that get a little bit more range out of the guy. And we get to hear Megatron say, when I get my hands on that traitor, his catalytic data <laughs> assembly is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another crazy robotic sounding thing. Yeah. It's like, it's, it also, it's like, uh, I know what they're trying to hint at. We, because we all heard grown up saying things like your, your hiney is mine or whatever, but like, <laughs> it, it makes me think that he's talking about some kind of like, weird organ his spleen is mine you know <laughs> <laughs> his his lower intestine is mine <laughs> they're back on cybertron starscream is wondering why the earth hasn't exploded and he orders archiville back to earth to go check the timer which is kind of odd because it's like yeah. earth's supposed to explode like now yeah. He's like, go go back to Earth and check the timer. Now, it's clearly at least a five-hour trip to Earth. <laughs> yeah. You would think that the odds are that your timing is just a little bit off and it's going to explode now or maybe yeah. now, now or maybe now. <laughs> yeah. But, but Starscream is concerned and he wants to send Arkville back. But the doctor points out that he can't just magically fly, unlike Starscream, who literally turns into a jet. So Starscream realizes he has to go back himself to figure out what's going on. Now, also, can we point out that this seems to be a recurring problem for Dr. Arkville is that his boss always changes their mind about what he can and cannot do. You know, like <laughs> Starscream's like, oh, you can't stay here to make sure the timer works because you'll, you know, I don't trust you. And then it's like, hey, the timer didn't work. Dr. Arkville, go back and fix the timer. It's like, but you told me not to. And then Megatron in Ultimate Doom is like, ah, the doctor's no longer useful to me. Hey, wait, no, I want the slaves to work better. Where's Dr. Archiville? Poor Dr. Archiville. I'm starting to really feel bad for this guy. <laughs> Back at the Earth lab, Megatron is removing the glowy part of the exponential generator, which is dangerously unstable. It's like a glowing egg, almost. Yeah. And after wrestling around and fighting over the device with Prime, Megatron realizes this thing is about to explode, but not here if Megatron can help it. See, even Megatron is going to save the Earth. Mm-hmm. No time to argue, Prime. Take this while I transform. Now load me. Fire! And Prime loads the device into Megatron's barrel and fires it into space. Now, hold on. Megatron transforms into gun mode, but he mm -hmm. is not little tiny gun mode, right? Yeah. Like, like, he transforms and he's like the same... Like, his mass doesn't get displaced because the exponential generator glowing egg thing is like the size of a football to a Transformer. Mm-hmm. 
like a football scale. Like if you held a football in your hands and you and the football grew to the size of Optimus Prime, that's how big this thing is. So Megatron can't fire the egg unless he is full on the size where Omega Supreme could handle him or Devastator mm-hmm. could handle him as a gun. So that's interesting too, is that not only are bad guys, good guys working together on this, but we get to see Megatron in gun mode at a different scale. Yeah, more of that mysterious mass shifting that seems to allow them to become whatever size they really need in the situation. Like Megatron can go down pretty small, but he can like stop it in the middle at some size. Mm-hmm. You know, very plot centric, but whatever. Yeah. So it exits the atmosphere as it's fired. Yeah. And here comes Starscream back to Earth. Which <laughs> I do love this. <laughs> time-wise, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but right. uh, we see this device explode just as Starscream is passing it. Yeah. It sends Starscream crashing back down to the Earth and conveniently right in front of the very angry Megatron. Well, the Decepticons have the same power that Autobots have. Yeah. Where if you're falling, always land by friends. <laughs> <laughs> And like, and this is like the one thing that Starscream wishes he didn't have in his technology. They're like, the computer's like, I'm helping you. I'm going to help you land by some of your friends. No, I don't want to land by my friends. I don't have any friends. Don't you understand, stupid computer? I'm helping you. <laughs> Look at what I did. You landed by your friend. And he, he, he lands on the ground. And he looks up and Megatron's like, ah, welcome home. And Starscream stutters and stammers. He says, Megatron, we we all thought you were dead. Uh, I wouldn't have done any of this if I thought you were alive. Uh, I, yeah. I've been a good boy, really, I promise. The only thing he's not doing is like the Rodney Dangerfield collar adjusting. We were sure that I could have sworn that. <laughs> and we see Megatron pick Starscream up and we cut to the Autobots. Yeah, it's just like a, like a quick wipe home. and... The Autobots are just driving home. (laughs) (laughs) And Bumblebee wonders what Megatron will do to Starscream. And Jazz remarks that Starscream getting his is the first good thing that happened all day. And they have a great laugh at Starscream's expense. Uh, Starscream's gonna die. (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) Apparently freedom is not a right if you're a terrible person like Starscream is. (laughs) Right. I find it somewhat problematic that they're all having a laugh out of the fact that Starscream is probably being tortured right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, notice Spike and Chip are nowhere to be found. And I think that this is a telling thing because I don't think they would talk that way in front of Spike or Chip. <laughs> you think the Autobots are like putting on a show and like, portraying themselves as more heroic than they actually are when they're in front of humans? I Well, let me put it this way. I think that they would be on better behavior if they knew their consciences were around, right? Like, <laughs> I think like they would say that, and then, like, Chip would be like, oh, come on, guys. And they'd be like, yeah, you're right. You're right. And Because, I mean, it's true. Like, we're all human, and we think, like, very, very unhappy things about some people in our lives, right? Like, or somebody cuts us off on the road, and we're like, oh, I, I don't like you very much. <laughs> But, like, we know we shouldn't think that way, right? And I think that's what Chip and Spike are there for. So the Autobots <laughs> are just showing that they're just people, too. You know, they have their, their shortcomings. But I wish Chip was there just to, like, shake his head sadly. And then everybody would be like, oh, okay, well, you're, you know, you're right after all. It's, we should hope for Starscream's redemption and not for, <laughs> and not for him to be harmed. <laughs> but, you know, it seems in all that mess of a plot, we never did see Laserbeak escape Jazz's tape deck. <laughs> I do like that. I wish that would have been like a little coda or after credit scene. <laughs> and like, like just cut to later and like jazz is like taking a nap and like we go inside of like inside of his dashboard and we see the tape there. We hear laser beaks, like squawky voice. Like, Hello. <laughs> Let me out. Or, or maybe this is the origin of buzzsaw. <gasps> like, Laserbeak was gone for a long time, and Soundwave just sort of was like, oh, he must have died. <laughs> so he builds a buzzsaw. I like that. And then Laserbeak comes back, and he's like, oh, Laserbeak, you're back. This is awkward. <laughs> Here's your new brother. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I like the idea of Soundwave being like, oh, he must have died. That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's true. You point out a major plot hole in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who 
Hoover lines him up and knocks him down, though, because he's always got a theory to explain <laughs> why something doesn't make very much sense. I've <sighs> never had a very full social life, so I've spent a lot of years with Transformers cartoons. <laughs> uh, desperately seeking fellow Transformers nerd. <laughs> that would be your Pina Colada song. <laughs> If you, if you like commenting on Starscream <laughs> and thinking thoughts of Cybertron. <laughs> we just wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so wrapping up. Thoughts on this episode? Countdown to Extinction? It's one that I would have categorized as being a less memorable episode, except for a few little tiny highlights. Like, oh, cool, Optimus mm-hmm. and Megatron working together. But... Uh, Thinking harder about it, I'm really moved by what they were promising with Dr. Archiville. This is another one of those things where, again, we keep talking about how Sunboat brings us right up to the point of growth and development, but then like takes three steps back or, or doesn't go any further than like getting us excited about it. In that Dr. Archiville could have, I would have liked to have seen a redemption story with him. And it feels like mm. this is pointing that direction with him. Yeah. How cool would it have been i mean again i'm thinking like c- comparing like with robotech how cool was it in macross when you saw Britai working with yeah. spoilers spoilers <laughs> the rdf like i remember as a child thinking like after so many episodes of Britai being a really kind of a menacing character and then mm-hmm. suddenly he's like smiling at our heroes yeah. as he's talking with them right yep. how cool would it have been to see an episode where dr archiville and chip chase are working side by side <laughs> I mean, if I were writing it, I would have him lapsing into his self-aggrandizement every once in a while, right? Like, there would be these moments where he's like, I, Dr. Archiville, genius of science, and Chip would be like, all right, come on, we got work to do here. He's like, oh, yeah, you're right, I'm sorry. It's old habits, you know? IDW, are you listening? <laughs> you know you want to green light that Chip Chase Dr. Archiville miniseries. Ugh. <laughs> Don't even, don't say it, IDW, unless you mean it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I would be really excited to like retell Megatron's master plan, parts one and two, but with Dr. Archiville in the mix, you know? Mm. And it'd be like, who can we help? Like, the Autobots are gone, so how can we stop this guy? Well, and then like you have it come out of the shadows, like there's one person who knows Megatron better than any of you. Uh, you know, and that's That would me. be a cool comeback. That would have been a cool comeback. Like, oh, we can't trust him. Oh, how could we trust him? You know, it's like, well, I'm the only person you can trust because I put my life on the line for humanity once and I'm ready to do it again. Hmm. Yeah, I'd like that. So, like, that's my takeaway from this. I feel like probably every episode is going to have some nugget of hidden promise at something interesting that could have been done that didn't get done. And I don't Mm -hmm. want to, like, end with this thought of this is a show that promises and never delivers because it does deliver on other things. It's just that I'm always coming at it from this aspect of, like, could you have gone just, like, 10% deeper with that character? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, what we talked about with Rumble and Skywarp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that that's another IDW miniseries that I think both of us <laughs> would be very excited to write. Like, do our version of Tag and Bank were here, you know? <laughs> yeah. But with Thundercracker and Rumble, and it would be like across the entire Gen 1 spectrum of like what they were doing at these critical moments. Like, what were <laughs> Skywarp and Rumble doing? Well, we can't say when Unicron attacked, can we? Damn it. <laughs> that would have been a, a fun scene to do, but... But okay, let's just go to any like critical moment in Gen 1 Transformers history and just show how they're intersecting with those worlds. Or show them intersecting with like the broader universe that was happening at that time. Like the Planet of Junk probably existed at that time. Mm. Quintessa existed during Gen 1 before Season 3, right? Could we have a story where Rumble and Skywarp interact with the Quintessons in some way? Hmm. And playing on that idea of like what happens when you take Megatron and Starscream out of the mix. How do these two brothers you know, navigate that relationship where neither's in charge. <laughs> so, uh, what about you? Are you listening, IDW? <laughs> <laughs> Please, listeners, don't think that we're actually serious. We know that IDW has no interest in, <laughs> in yeah. hiring us for our crazy cartoon continuity stories. <laughs> That's right. We're not trying to like to mob a publisher because I'm already working in the comics industry and I don't need <laughs> anybody in the comics industry to get angry with me. He's like, why are you doing that? Why don't you just send us a pitch like a regular person? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what, what are your 10,000 foot up uh, view of this episode? Well, the plot is kind of a mess. 
It's like for there to be this whole new sort of MacGuffin Mm -hmm. at the end of this, you know, big three-part series where the Earth was almost destroyed. And, oh, by the way, now there's this whole new way the Earth could be destroyed. It just seems a little weird. And just the fact that most of the episode is spent on the the Autobots just following the Decepticons. (laughs) Yeah. I said Cannonball Run earlier, but I think it's more like Smokey and the Bandit. (laughs) <laughs> if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna like use car chase metaphors, it's just it's just them just following this. The whole plan is just like follow them. What are they up to? And then like Megatron like not deviating from his course. Like okay, well let's take a roundabout way so the Autobots can't follow us. Nope, I'm gonna stay on the road. <laughs> so that part feels kind of like and in there's not much imaginative stuff that happens there outside of the quicksand. Yeah, it just seems to be like there to take up time. Yeah, yeah. C.S. Lewis once talked about like the difficulties with writing novels is like you come up with all the interesting parts and you have to find all of the spade work <laughs> in between, you know, yeah, and that makes sense. That feels like this is what was going on there. I know I've written comics where I've had some spade work in there. <laughs> <laughs> this is me digging around in the garden for a little while until we get to the cool part. Well, that's when it's great to inject really fun character moments. But uh, when they're sinking in quicksand, there's not a lot of fun character moments. I mean, you could say that jazz is talking about laser beak as if he's like like he's a columbia house cassette <laughs> yeah you could say that the jazz is talking about laser beak like he's an earth cassette and playing some earth tunes and that sort of little exchange they had but uh you know other than that it was just sort of like okay we have to delay the autobots <laughs> yeah. how are we gonna do that we can't have them, have them get there until like it's 10 seconds to go yeah so it's just kind of messy plot wise i mean there's some really fun interactions as it was clearly made clear by me at the beginning of the show Mm -hmm. (laughs) other than that i mean yeah you're right we compare this to episodes like roll for it where it feels like that's a really packed 21 minutes like a lot Mm -hmm. of stuff happens in in roll for it yeah and this could have had more plotty stuff happening or like you said if not that could we learn something more about the characters what did Mm -hmm. we learn we learned that bumblebee gets buried and then Brock yeah. can dig him out. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it is just seemed to be they're done to kill time. Yeah, you're right. And like, there isn't even anything interesting with regard to the Decepticons' interactions when they're fighting against the Autobots outside of the fact that Megatron likes to stand up on a rock and gloat. Right. And, yeah. and, and then apparently likes to sneak up on people. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! <laughs> yeah, so this, this feels kind of like an awkward episode. I mean, it's awkward going in because it's part four of a three part series. <laughs> So it just continues the awkwardity all throughout its 22 minutes. So, But I think a gift it gives us is a scene where we see the Decepticons interacting without Megatron or Starscream driving the conversation. Yeah. Yeah, that was definitely a gift and I loved it. But like I said earlier, it was was only like the first two minutes of the show. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) That's very true. I think we're both shining a light on a, a missed opportunity for the entire series where they just they didn't really do a whole lot with what happens when the boss is gone. Mm-hmm. In Divide and Conquer, when Optimus is dying, and you know they do that whole scene where Spike's like, you know, we got to go fight the Decepticons ourselves, and, and and Huffer says, oh, but we can, we got your message, Spike, and it's like, okay, cool, they're going to show that these guys can come together even when their leader is. Not in the picture. But no, what do they wind up with? Nope, we really need our leader. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And this feels like that first scene was like the same kind of idea. Like you said, you you would not be against a miniseries about a rudderless Decepticon army. Yeah. That's the kind of meat and potatoes I just want to chomp into. And and the, the funny part is I don't think either of us would really care about any kind of new revelations about the status quo of the universe, right? It's right. Like, it, it, what you do about Transformers was totally undone by this new miniseries. Like, no, we just want to – actually, we want a Giffen and Dematis Decepticon yes. miniseries. There you go. Where it's, it's literally them just chasing a mouse around the base. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's like our mythical editor in this situation is like, okay, uh, what happens this issue? Uh, well, they get into an argument and they start a fight, but then uh, they get the fight gets broken up. <laughs> no, I mean, like, plot-wise, what happens? That is the plot. That is the plot, yeah. Oh, and then Rumble finds out that he didn't pay the electrical bill. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our cliffhanger for the next episode. Uh, we're going to have to renegotiate this contract. <laughs> so if IDW is listening, this is the part where they turn to walk away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I also think this episode is definite evidence that if anybody ever did want to do a mini series that ties together all of the loose ends and plot holes in the Transformers series, we found our guy. It's <laughs> <laughs> one thing I love to clean up is loose ends. <laughs> That's right. In, in Transformers. Ah. <sighs> uh. All right. Well, thank you for this one. It was another good one, Hoover. So what do we got next? What's the next episode? Next up is a plague of Insecticons. Does that mean new characters? Uh Uh-oh. Your wallet's got a little bit of a break this episode, but hope it's well-rested because three new characters debut next episode. Tell your parents. (laughs) All right. Now available at your local store. So we will see you next week for A Plague of Insecticons. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of 4 million years later.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. I've been Hoover, who did not explode at the end like he thought he would. <laughs> Thank goodness. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. Closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas-mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>